I find it really devastating what has been done to children's healthy bodies unnecessarily on the NHS, on the National Health Service. Coming up on British Thought Leaders, Stephanie Davies Arai talks about the trend of diagnosing children as transgender. That there is now this new cohort of adults in the world who've never been through puberty. So to me, this is, you know, Frankenstein. You know, it's, it's really... Uh, and without any evidence to show that it's beneficial, except the manufactured studies done by activists. Stephanie warns that the medical procedures are not the only danger. The indoctrination of children is coming from every direction. Say you're a girl in school and you're being trained every day to call a boy in your class she um, and accept that that boy is allowed to go into your toilets and changing rooms. and That's grooming. That is um, bringing up a girl to have no boundaries or no understanding of her right to have boundaries with the opposite sex. It puts girls at risk. Welcome to British Thought Leaders, I'm Lee Hall. Today I'm sitting down with the Director of Transgender Trend, Stephanie Davies Arai. Stephanie, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So we've seen in recent times the rise of children who say they're born in the wrong body. Like boys wanted to become girls, girls wanted to become boys. I was trying to get some idea of how widespread this is. Can you give us some numbers? Well, it really started to, the numbers started to rise in around 2015 when there was a 100% increase in referrals to the Tavistock, which, which is the Child and Adolescent Gender Clinic in London. And that corresponded with a huge push in activism. Stonewall, for example, who used to be a really respected organisation that supported the rights of gay people, added T to the LGB in 2015. The BBC had actually broadcast a film to six to documentary to six to twelve year olds in at the end of 2014 um, about a girl who transitioned into a boy with lots of misinformation. It it uh, was a promotion of puberty blockers. It um, it was basically telling children that it's possible to have a male brain in a female body. So it's a real piece of propaganda to children. And and then I, I think in April 2015, there's a documentary series by Louis Theroux, which is very popular. And he broadcast an episode called Transgender Kids. And I thought then, this is it, that now it's gone mainstream. Because I'd been seeing newspaper reports before then, probably from around 2013, of children transitioning, usually very little children in schools. And it was an immediate red flag to me that that was happening to children. Mm -hmm. But yes, I think it was 2015, so it corresponded with the big push in um, trans activism. Also in August um, in 2015, there was uh, the Women in Equality Select Committee did a consultation on transgender equality. And very few of us knew about it. It wasn't so it wasn't common knowledge, and I think a lot of people thought, oh, that's not an issue that um, is related to me. It's not. So very, very few people knew what was going on and responded to that consultation. And those of us who did, raising concerns, um, because it was about reform of the Gender Recognition Act, um, making it easier to change your le sex legally on your birth certificate. It was, it was um, you know, it was, it was serious. Uh, but those of us who responded with concerns were not invited in to give oral evidence. We were sort of ignored. And the um, committee put out a list of um, recommendations after that, which was a sort of wish list of trans activists including lower, lowering the age when you could uh, change your birth certificate, get a gender recognition certificate to 16, so it's currently 18. Um, 
and that led that led to later on in 2018 there was a, a GRA uh, reform consultation and um, I, I, and that failed to achieve essentially self ID in the UK, but that was down to work of um, a, a, sort of grassroots or women's organisations on our side, there's a, a particularly a group called Fair Play for Women. Um, so yeah, I, I, I always pinpoint 2015 as the year that it really kicked off and became mainstream. And after that, of course, the, the numbers of, in terms of referrals to the Tavistock Gender Clinic, they skyrocketed after that. When a child goes to the medical professional and, and they affirm this wish to be in another body, what impact do you think that has on the child? Well, I, I think it's really important. The same with teachers. These, these are medical professionals or teachers. They're, they're adults in positions of authority. They're adults that children believe. Why wouldn't you? And they're also adults that parents believe. And so if an adult in that position of authority is saying to a child, um, say, saying to a teenage girl, so you identify as a boy, what pronouns would you like me to use? And just accepts that. Um, then everything that that girl has learned, and I think the teenage cohort are also, of course, learning online. So they're looking at TikTok. They're learning from TikTok and, and YouTube. And when I started in 2015, it was mostly Reddit and... Um, uh, Tumblr yeah. and YouTube videos and now it's mostly TikTok and uh, still YouTube videos and teenage girls are watching videos put out by young women who are taking testosterone and chart their journey in the changes you know growing a beard um, and then and also that that will often lead to having a double mastectomy and then showing off your mastectomy scars and it's presented as a glamorous uh, you know like sort of lifestyle choice it's it, it's cool it's to be celebrated and these videos are, um, on YouTube have got hundreds of thousands of teenage girl followers so YouTube influencers are also a part of the part of the picture um, so the the indoctrination of children is coming from every direction and now it's it's being um, uh, uh, reinforced uh, uh, in schools and it's being taught and so activist groups have developed uh, schools resources and it seems to it seems there's a new activist group springing up every week so many of them now but it began with Stonewall and the school resources are for both primary and secondary schools. So the youngest children are now being targeted. You know, I've never known a campaign um, ostensibly about human rights that's targeted children so directly as this one. Do you think the, the medical profession has let children down in this area? Absolutely. Um, I think the NHS England has become um, overtaken by an ideology and you can see that right through the NHS it, um, changing language um, erasing the word woman when it comes to women's health um, having mixed sex wards when which they claim are are single sex but you can identify into the women's ward um, so and and you see you see like big pride displays in children's hospitals you see posters uh, that are real um, propaganda posters uh, produced by activist groups in doctors waiting rooms you know it's it's completely uh, been overtaken and completely captured by an ideology and that ideology is now really embedded throughout the NHS as well as the rest of society schools the police the government you know there's um, so it, 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 you know, untangling it, and getting it out again, uh, is is quite a job. There are so many places that we have to look at and try and get rid of it. You know, are we seeing ideology prioritised above safeguarding? Absolutely, and you don't you don't do that. I mean, for me, any 
professional who works with children, any sort of childcare or child health related uh, job, those adults are safeguarding trained. And yet, once the word trans is mentioned, safeguarding goes out of the window. It's as if we, for we, ha we forget everything about child development, child psychology, safeguarding children. And it's, it's a complete blind spot. Anybody, it's, it's, it's sort of anybody who's under the rainbow flag gets a free pass. That is a huge danger and red flag in terms of safeguarding. So it's not just safeguarding children from experimental medi um, medication, from being lied to, from being groomed online, uh, which is happening. Um, it's safeguarding children um, in terms of other children's rights. So if you're, say you're a girl in school and you're being trained every day to call a boy in your class she um, and accept that that boy is allowed to go into your toilets and changing rooms and that's grooming. That is um, bringing up a girl to have no boundaries or no understanding of her right to have boundaries with the opposite sex. It puts girls at risk in, in environments outside the school where you know, g girls need to be able to trust their instinct about a man, even if he's wearing a dress. Trust your gut instinct and don't be afraid of being rude to him or hurting his feelings. You know, that's what girls need to learn in, in, you know, in, in terms of self-protection. But, but children deserve and, and have a right to be protected by adults and protected by society. And that's, that's not happening. It seems that's gone completely out of the window. And we've got professionals who understand or, or, or are supposed to understand about child development who somehow seem to think that this is a group of magical rainbow children who don't uh, develop in the same way as other children. They know themselves from birth. They're right about themselves and we can't question them. And they've got this sort of deep wisdom and knowledge and understanding. So I was listening to, it was a, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it was a webinar, but it was a discussion between a group of school nurses uh, recently, last week. And I couldn't believe, but I've heard this so many times before, it shocks me every time, talking about, oh, well, all the children, they they really know about gender, don't they? They're so far ahead of us, you know, they're teaching us. And every time I hear adults say that, I think, where do you think the children are learning this from? You know, what, what you know, why aren't you asking? Because really it's, it's garbage in, garbage out from the kids. They've been so thoroughly indoctrinated into this online and then they say it, but, but ad it's adults' job to question, well, where are children learning these things? Who's telling them and why? Well, can you give us some insight into what impact this is having on families? Absolutely devastating. And so when I, when I started Transgender Trend in 2015, for the first couple of years, I spent quite a lot of time actually on the phone to parents. And it was because there wasn't any other group, it was, it, you know, up until that point, that parents could go to and find out accurate information. Because I saw Transgender Trend as a resource for parents where they could find out what the studies said and and uh, and also analyze what was happening and, and analyze the message to children and so it was the first time they had somebody to talk to that that understood and up until that point and it's still the case now um these parents are painted as bigots that they're unsupportive they're transphobic and there's no help for these parents. Normally, if you're a parent and your child is um, heading towards drugs, and, and the drugs that they will take will affect them for life, these are irreversible um, medical interventions. And you've got a child who's suddenly come home and is repeating from a script like a robot, and you, you, you're suspicious about what's going on, and. Uh, where they've learned what, you know. In other words, the, the best thoughtful parents have been demonised as um, 
unsupportive at best, transphobic bigots at worst, for um, understanding their children, having suspicions about what's going on in their child's life. And um, they have no sort of medical health or clinical uh, professionals to help them because unless you simply unquestioningly um, affirm that your daughter is now your son, you're a bigot. So these parents, are, but also it, it's split up families, it's devastating for families, and it affects every member of the family, including the siblings. And if you can imagine, for say, a younger sibling who's adored um, older sister becomes brother, and the confusion for that child. Um, and they go into school and everybody's celebrating trans, 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 there's pride flags and posters up in the, in the classrooms, yeah. we're celebrating Pride Month, we're celebrating tr Trans Day of Remembrance and all the other, um, and nobody's allowed to question it. Um, that tr those siblings also don't, don't get any help and support or understanding of often the trauma that they're going through and the confusion and distress. So it, it's, it's absolutely devastating for families. This has all happened so quickly. I mean, when I was a child, this really didn't exist. What do you think's behind it? Is it these activist forces that have really made this blow up so much? I think there's so many different aspects that have sort of come together at the same time. Uh, I don't think it's a huge con conspiracy theory where everybody knows what's going on, but I certainly think there is a global activist movement. I think the identity part, which part is part of identity politics, a much broader identity politics, equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, the idea that there are uh, privileged people and oppressed people and everything the privileged people do is wrong and evil and if you're an oppressed in, a, in an oppressed group it's impossible for you to be an oppressor you know it, it, it's that kind of thinking uh, um, so I so the gender identity ideology comes within that broader global uh, movement um, but I think gender, <coughs> gender identity itself is the most dangerous, um, most dang certainly most dangerous for children because it gets to children at the heart of who they are as human beings while they're developing, um, before they have reached a sort of psychosexual um, development, full development. They're still growing, they're still learning, they're still trying to understand themselves and who they are. Um, it pulls the rug of reality out from under their feet right from the start and um, it creates children who are both victims and narcissists because at one and the same time they're told they're the most vulnerable marginalised group. They're liable to commit suicide if they're not affirmed. They're so delicate and vulnerable. Um, everybody hates them and wants um, uh, um, to annihilate them. This is the, the, the messages the children are learning. <clears throat> and yet, at the same time, they have the power to change everyone's language. They have the power to change policies in schools. They are celebrated as the, I think they've become the um, only really sort of, um, tribe to belong to in school and that we used to have a lot of different tribes that teenagers join you know goths emos punks um uh, and now it's really it's it's a it's sort of gender identity tribe you've got to be trans or non-binary um and everything else. if you're cis so the new binary is according to the ideology is not male female it's transgender cisgender and if you're boring cis het white, <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know, there's a list of things that you cannot be if you're if you're a teenager, um, and you know that uh, you, that they're seen as evil oppressors that, that that group. So it's become the only the only sort of alternative um, group 
for teenagers who want to rebel, who want to show they're different, who wants to, who want to show they're non-conventional. So you've worked with children who went through medical procedures to, to change their sex and then change their mind and then detransitioned. Can you help us understand what they've been through and how this affects their futures? Uh, well, this is, I mean, it's, yeah, I find it, I find it really devastating what has been done to children's healthy bodies unnecessarily on the NHS, on the National Health Service. And just as it's around 75% teenage girls now going to gender clinics, it's predominantly young women who are detransitioning because the number of the numbers, there are young men as well. Um, but the young women have typically taken testosterone, had a double mastectomy. Um, the hair and beard growth is for life. Um, some have developed male pattern baldness. Um, they have no breasts. They are now trying to be women again. And, I, I, you know, the ones that I know are just, just they're great. They're, you know, they're so courageous. Kira Bell, for example, who, who um, took the Tavistock Clinic to court for her treatment. Um, it was a judicial review. Incredible bravery. And not many, you know, a, a lot of detransitioners don't speak out because they're so damaged by the treatment and also they get attacked horribly by trans activists who want who's you know the the, the trans activists accusations are always a mirror to what you know that th they will accuse de detransitioners of, of not existing of not being real um so you you're putting yourself at real risk if you speak out and and often of course you're not in, in that position, you, you don't feel strong enough to speak out and take all of that horrible abuse. Yeah, it takes it, you know it takes real courage. But we've we've got some uh, you know the detransitioners all over the world now speaking out, and um, in the U.S. they're they're speaking out at congressional hearings and uh, doing amazing work. And unfortunately, I think it's going to take. The detransitioners don't want to give them a job, but really for people to understand really what's going on. So I think the Kira Bell case in the UK that went global, um, and it really introduced people. It, it raised public awareness of what is actually being done to children's bodies before they've grown up enough to to understand. I, there's no way they can give informed consent to these treatments, but I think a lot of people just didn't realise, they thought it was necessary and even life-saving treatment, which is the message that's been promoted by the um, trans lobby groups. Do you expect to see more legal action in the future? Yes, yes. I mean, there's legal action going on now. Um, there's a detransitioner, um, Richie, who's uh, taking his, this is an adult gender clinic, to court. And, uh, and, and there's more there's more going on that I know about. Um, and the, there's, there's another one that's um, taking the NHS to court about the transfer of 17-year-olds into the adult clinics. So, of course, the Tavistock Child and Adolescent Clinic is closing in April. But the adult... And the, and the service has been completely changed now, but the adult clinics remain the same. They're ideologically based, um, that the model is affirmation and informed consent. There's, there's nothing else like that in, in the NHS where the patient self-diagnoses and their self-diagnosis is, is, is uh, accepted by the doctors and they're given irreversible, you know, really serious medical intervention on the basis of an identity. But that's happening in the adult clinics and 17-year-olds are going to the adult clinics. And whereas in the NHS there's, there's a mental health pathway that has a transitional young adult um, age group, which is I think around 17 to 25, and there's no such transitional pathway within the 
gender services. So you go, whereas the, the new clinics that are being set up now will be fo focused on psychotherapy, exploration, um, differential diagnosis, looking at underlying mental health issues, trauma, other issues that are going on in the child's life. Um, so it's, it's now therapy-based, whereas in the adult clinics you can go and um, in a couple of appointments you can be referred for surgery to have your breasts removed. At 18 you can have genital surgery. So w with no safeguards at all. So these are incredibly, I think this is a really, a really vulnerable age group. A lot of these um, the young people, the older teens and young adults, some of them have gone off to university and found this community of queer identity uh, uh, rights groups, um, LGBTQ+, plus, whatever, rainbow groups. And being away from home for the first time, it's, it, you know, you're, you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable to influence, you're, you're vulnerable to, um, you know, you, you want to be included, you want to be accepted. And also you're, you're out of the jurisdiction of your parents and your parents don't have any power anymore. So, you know, they, 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 don't, um, they don't have any say in what they, they can't even be told what's going on, you know, without the, ch the child's permission. So, so that's a really vulnerable age group, completely on their own, not yet grown up, as any parent knows, and yet they are being highly influenced by universities that are all captured. Um, I think most universities in the UK are Stonewall diversity champions. They have um, gender-neutral toilets, and really, really um, strict rules. It's quite totalitarian, um, this dogma, and it is, it's a dogma, it is, you know, totally enforced. And so students now, you know, what student could speak up against it? We've seen the NHS England say they're no longer prescribing uh, puberty blockers as routine treatment for children who are distressed about gender. I mean, how important is this decision and why? Well, it's, it's crucial. <laughs> And it started with the actually it started with the Kira Bell Judicial Review in 2020 led to um, because Kira Bell and Mrs A who's who is the mother of an autistic daughter on the waiting list for the Tavistock uh, the case was won and very clearly won that the judges found that children were unable to give fully informed consent to this treatment but subsequently the case was it was overturned on appeal and the judges for the reason not the findings weren't overturned but the the reasoning was that um, this was not uh, a, a, a case for legal experts the responsibility lay with the medical professionals and for so the NHS had started the complete review of the Tavistock and um, Dr. Hilary Cass, who's a really respected um, paediatrician, ran the independent review and her findings, her interim findings were published in 2021. Her final report is due very soon. Um, and so that report was really damning of the affirmation approach in the, or the pressure clinicians felt within the Tavistock um, to, to do just a, 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 an unquestioning affirm, a, affirmation approach, which led to diagnostic overshadowing. So in other words, all the children, children's underlying mental health issues or um, family history, a lot of the, you know, there's a disproportionate number of children from the care system, autistic children, children with pre-existing mental health issues. Um, of course, before that, we'd had whistleblowers at the Tavistock. I mean, Sue, Sue Evans was whistleblowing in 2005, and that led to a report by David Taylor, which actually 
you could read that now and say and compare it to the CAS interim report and say it was the same back in 2005, 2006. And then David Bell also produced a report um, in 2018, which was from concerns raised to him uh, by clinicians at the Tavistock. So this scandal has been going on a long time. The Care Quality Commission, which is the regulator, um, inspected the Tavistock and, and judged it inadequate, which is the lowest rating you can get. So all of those things together, as part of the CAS independent review, um, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, NICE, uh, was commissioned to do two systematic reviews of the um, looking at the benefits of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and for both they found that the evidence for the benefits was a very low certainty. And so all those things together, the NHS um, looked at its policies, decided that Tavistock was to be closed down. I mean, did, did, Tavistock didn't collect data, didn't follow up these children. Um, it was really shocking how um, negligent they were. They had started a trial of puberty blockers in 2011. And before publishing the results of that trial, they rolled it out to, um, to all children in 2014. So it's been going on since then, and we think around 2,000 children have been given blockers. Um, they published the results of their study finally. Actually, it was just after the Kira Bell initial judi judicial review uh, finished. And it found 98% of that of that original cohort of 44 children had gone on to um, uh, cross-sex hormones, and this is this is I mean this is this is the only uh, area where these studies are being replicated everywhere. That yes, most children once they're on blockers, they don't get off the medical pathway; they they go on to more irreversible treatments. Um, and I think block. I think this is really significant of the NHS, but they are still planning to do a clinical trial, a proper clinical trial. But they need ethical approval for that. I don't think they should get it. I think it for such experimental treatment with really no proven benefits and um, risks that you know both known and unknown serious risks. I don't think it's ethical to do even within a trial situation. Um, but if they don't get ethical approval for the puberty blockers trial, they won't pres prescribe puberty blockers at all. Right. So that's really big, big news. From a non-medical perspective, it's hard to understand that. Why, why would you block puberty? Isn't that a normal part of growing it, up? It's, I, I, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but even I know that a child needs to go through puberty to reach adulthood. And it's not just, I see this a lot that it said, the, the sex hormones at puberty, um, that's how secondary sex characteristics develop. It's not just that, it's every part of the body needs those sex, or, you know, estrogen for girls and, and testosterone for boys. Every part of the body needs those hormones. It's the it's the most critical growth spurt, you know, <laughs> in, a, in a lifespan, puberty. And so if you're not getting the hormones that your body needs to grow, you're, you're, you know, it's stunted growth. And, you know, we, we've, there are quite well publicised concerns about uh, bone density. And, of course, if children go on from blockers to cross-sex hormones, they will be permanently sterilised. And there's also concern about loss of sexual function, um, never being able to achieve orgasm. That's a, you know, that's a huge, all of these things are huge losses that children cannot possibly understand. Um, but the, th the area that's always concerned me most is the brain, because I, I know that that's a critical time of, um, brain pr pruning and reorganisation at puberty. And that process of, the, you know, the, the 
adolescent brain. It doesn't end until your mid-twenties. And so to interfere with that, I've always felt is, is, well, we're really playing God here, aren't we, on children? Because if you, and, and also the fact that you, if you block puberty and then the child goes on to the wrong sex hormones, um, that child has essentially never gone through puberty. That child has never sexually developed. You know, you're only developing a facsimile of the opposite sex characteristic ca characteristics. You know, you're not actually, do you know, a girl who goes on to testosterone is not going to start producing sperm or grow a penis. You know, a boy is not going to start um, develop a womb and be able to produce eggs. You know, it's, it's not going through puberty. So we're having that there is now this new cohort of adults in the world who've never been through puberty. So to me, this is you know Frankenstein. You know, it's it's really and without any evidence to show that it's beneficial, except the manufactured studies done by activists which are all you know such low quality and don't show what they claim they do show but of course they get published in scientific journals and people believe them um but there is so it, it's it's huge news and it, i think it's gone global that the nhs has stopped puberty blockers and hopefully uh, completely hopefully the the the, the, the trial will not gain ethical approval. Is that just NHS England or the other? Yes. Okay. NHS Scotland is completely ignoring what's going on, and I don't, I don't understand how that's possible, but they are. Uh, the Sandyford uh, Child and Adolescent Clinic in Glasgow has completely ignored what the Dr. Hilary Cass's report and the Tavistock being closed down. All those situations very similar in Scotland. But there's there's still something. I mean, we're we're not. It's not over yet. Um, the children who are going to these new clinics are still, and I have asked the NHS this, and I haven't received a, a reply. Um, but what it seems from what's been written in the consultations so far is that cross-sex hormones will still be offered to children at age 16, and previously they were only offered after a child had been on blockers for a year and now they can children can have cross sex hormones without having been on blockers um so they mentioned in one of the um uh, one of the consultations that they would have to change the service specification for cross sex hormones to to change that requirement to be on blockers first now Where's the consultation on that? I, it, you know, this is what I've asked, and nobody seems to know whether there will be a new clinical commissioning policy for cross-sex hormones at age 16, and a public consultation on that. I've heard, I've heard nothing, so I'm worried about that because, of course, everybody, you know, people pr pretended, and, and the NHS said for a long time that blockers were fully reversible. Of course, they're not. They, ca they can't be. Um, if you're delaying a child's puberty, that is going to have effects. But um, even if they go, go off the blockers. But um, uh, the cross-sex hormones, nobody's pretended that they don't have irreversible effects. But the evidence for their benefits is, is, is as low as for puberty blockers. And then we get into surgeries. Well, you know, the, 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 the risks of surgeries, including double mastectomy, which girls are being encouraged to think this is a really simple operation. It's not. It's major surgery. Um, but yes, the puberty blockers, I'm, you know, it was the, when I was talking about the brain, um, one, of the, one of the ways that um, blockers have been justified is that they are licensed for, you, for use in precocious puberty. So if a girl starts, and it's mostly girls, but if a girl starts puberty at age seven or eight you know it's going to be really hard it, it is that is a physiological condition and blockers are used for a defined period and then stopped and then after about a year puberty 
resumes and it'll be at a, at a more normal stage in, in line with peers. So there are reasons, you know, but I don't think there has been proper research into blockers used for precocious puberty either. If you try and find the studies that prove that they're safe, there's very little that that, that you can find, but there are studies that show a drop in IQ points. And that is a huge, um, and again, I think parents of children um, going through precocious puberty, very early puberty, need to know the full facts, just as parents need to know the full facts if um, their child is, is suddenly identifying as trans. And the drop in IQ, IQ points is a huge, um, you know, I, IQ is very stable throughout the lifetime. And it's, um, there was one case of, I think it um, was an 11, a child who was tested at 11 years old, I think, who'd had a, dr a drop of about 10 IQ points. And it took, that the child's IQ at the start was 80, so there was a, a low IQ and it had dropped into borderline learning disabled. And the impact of, that's a huge drop, huge drop. And, and the impact on that in a child's life is enormous in, in what they're able to achieve educationally in terms of relationships, in terms of living life. It's huge and, and, um, and to be promoting a treatment that the, the the real research on the brain has not been done, and these blockers were given to children off label for for this new uh, uh, condition of being transgender, and which is not a clinical diagnosis or doesn't have any meaning. Doesn't you know? It doesn't have any objective meaning. That word. It's, it's, it's really what I think of as just a political label that has politicised children. We've seen the, the CAS review at Tavistock closing, um, the NHS England decision. Do you think that the tide is starting to turn? Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's, there's far more public awareness now. Um, I think politicians are begin, begin, beginning to realise that they can't get away with pulling the wool over people's eyes on this one. Um, so, yeah, the more people who speak... I mean, we've had um, famous people like J.K. Rowling speaking out has been huge because it's it's been very visible, uh, the attacks on her, and um, she's really taken one for the team. You know, she's really put her head above the parapet and uh, she didn't have to do that. Women love her for it and I think that's made a huge difference in the UK. I mean she's a British institution, we're proud of JK Rowling and so for her to speak out is huge. Um, and we've had um, Graham, Graham Linehan who's a really well-loved comic who wrote some, has written some of the best-loved comedy um, sort of sitcoms that we've had and yet the way that he's been treated by fellow comedians we really owe a debt to the famous people who've speak, spoken up because what they've done is they've made visible the bullying and the um, authoritarianism of this movement that will not accept any debate, will not accept any questioning. What changes would you like to see? The government have just brought out draft <coughs> uh, schools guidance and the consultations just closed on that one um, with very good intentions to, that, that really children should not be socially transitioned in schools. And I would put it that gender affirmation is an activist approach. Uh, it's political, it's ideological, and it should be nowhere near schools, nowhere near children. It's a belief system. Um, so the government have have gone some way to acknowledging that, well, they do in, in the draft guidance, that gender identity ideology is a contested theory um, that not everybody believes in. And, but they leave loopholes of 
sort of ex exceptional cases and um, it if there are any loopholes in this guidance at all then the situation will, rem will remain as it is now which is the activist teachers dicta dictate policy in the school or the activist parent of the trans child it has it, it is actually all or nothing I mean do we teach children reality and the truth which is you can't change sex and the definition of girl is young um, uh, human female. A girl isn't a gender identity. It's not a subjective identity. It's a, it's a biological reality. Do we teach children di uh, reality or do we teach them ideology? You can't do a bit of both. You can't teach children the world is round but integrate flat earthism in the, in, into, the, into the curriculum. You know, you, you've got to choose. Um, and unless there are clear rules from the DfE, you're leaving it up to schools. And if parents legally challenge schools, schools are terrified of legal challenge. And, the, and the, that, that fear has been created again by trans organisations telling them that unless they let boys use the girls' toilets, that it'll be in, in breach of the Equality Act. So they've been really, um, let's say, misleading um, uh, um, advice on the law and schools are really you know have been really scared and so they've been socially transitioning children and sometimes behind parents backs uh, Liz Truss put out a bill re that was filibustered in Parliament uh, last week um, on Friday shamefully um, didn't have and time for the reading about their past names weren't they to try and stop them yeah and and I think they thought it was funny and it was it was just so shameful, and I hope they look back and feel that shame. But um, because this bill, it really dealt with a lot of things all at once. So it was making sure that the definition of sex in the Equality Act means biological sex only, um, banning puberty blockers, which is still needed because the private clinics are still prescribed. Will still, I mean, they they will be doing a great trade now. Uh, with parents who can afford it. Um, <clears throat> so we do need a, a, a wider ban and banning social transition in schools. And so that would have dealt with a lot of things. Um, of course, because of course all the, all the activist groups have written um, in response to the draft schools guidance saying this is an attack on trans kids and it's <clears throat> discrimination towards trans kids and it's um, unlawful and they've been encouraging parents, teachers and even children to respond to the government consultation on it. Mm. But it's actually, it's not just the activist groups. You see teaching uni unions, you see um, children's charities like NSPCC, Brook Charity um, and uh, um, professional um, organisa health organisations, um, counselling organisations also um, obviously uh, in opposition to this bill, seeing it as, as, as discriminatory towards trans kids. So once, once you invent that category of people and say that there's this group of children who are trans, even though trans doesn't mean anything, then that's a group that you, has protected rights and, and that's the way it's taken forward. We, you know, and that needs to be challenged you know, at root. And what interests me is when I see a sort of a response in opposition to the government's draft guidance or saying that it's unlawful or is that it, or, or that it, it somehow is, is not kind um, and I think we have to understand that 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 gender affirmation is not being kind gender affirmation is affirming a girl's self-hatred um, it's affirming a delusion in a way that we would not affirm the delusion of being fat that anorexic children have we would never do that we would not see it as kind so the girl who believes herself to be a boy is in reality not a boy and to actually um, encourage children to deny what is reality and what they can actually never change 
I think is cruelty. So we have to question, but again, because the activists have put forward gender affirmation as the only legitimate and kind response to these children, even sort of professional organisations who should know better have just taken that at face value. And I think it's not discrimination against a child not lying to them. How can it be? You know, it's, 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 it's this is crazy upside down world that's been created. Stephanie Davis-Sarai, thank you for joining us. Thank you.